George Simonson's family has resided in Canton since 1893 when his grandparents, Henry and Lucinda, moved here from Canada. George, what do you know about their early lives and what brought them to this community? I, I know my grandfather was a timber scaler, but he, um, he was a farmer. There was, um, I think there was two, two boys, two, the two boys owned a section of land. And when they uh, decided to come over to uh, the United States, they sold the farm to a cousin. And at that time, the uh, family burying ground was always on the back end of the farm. And uh, in having one of our reunions over there, we decided to all go back and find that burying ground. But the uh, cousins that bought the property, they kind of mercenary. So they elected to take all the big tombstones and put them on the back end of the field so they could till the whole cemetery. And I, uh, I, I know it kind of hurt the family that owned it. There was one sister to it, I forgot about that. But they, uh, they were kind of put out about that, but we did see the pile of tombstones and went over them and got dates off of them to put up in the museum on Walco Island. But they, uh, they, they, tobacco was one of the main industries over there at that time. And uh, they, uh, there was tobacco sheds on that farm. They used to cure the tobacco of that in sheds, hang it up in sheds. I remember my father, after, I can remember him going back over there and bringing some of the tobacco back. And it was so strong that he couldn't, he was a tobacco chewer, but it was so strong he couldn't uh, he couldn't tolerate it. So they had one fellow here that he he chew anything. So, and Dad, <laughs> my father gave it to him, and uh, he he chewed quite a bit of it. But then he said he just kept getting heartburn so bad and headaches. <clears throat> so in the, between the two, they uh, decided that. Uh, thing to do with it would be to soak it in water and soak a lot of that uh, nicotine out. And uh, <clears throat> then they had the idea that my father had written uh, this boulder to smoking tobacco people and they gave him the ingredients in boulder and it was nothing but uh, alfalfa, alpha, ground up alfalfa alpha, soaked in uh, juice from tobacco. So that's what they did. <laughs> And those depression times, you know. But at that time, my, my uh, younger sister came on the scene, and uh, my father said, Well, I can't feed babies and chew tobacco, too. So he quit chewing tobacco, and his nerves just went all kafloos. <laughs> he drove us crazy chewing gum. <laughs> but uh, that was about a, I know he talked about his father walking along the. Uh, it's out on the 11th concession, I think, going out toward uh, Wallaceburg. And uh, there was a, had to cross the Snye Carter River. And uh, when, on the bridge crossing the river, black snakes would curl up in the sun. And he said, my grandfather got about halfway across the bridge. And he seen that. <laughs> so he, he jumped over in the river <laughs> and swam. <laughs> and so, so he, he was scared to death of a, of a snake. But that, then they, and uh, I don't understand why he'd be so afraid because he had to go through deep in the timber business and you know, quite a few snakes in woods. But, uh, then he uh, was running out of product that he was making his money off of. So. He came over here and started my, uh, on the Rouge River. He started down in uh, Fairlane. I can't find the pictures, but uh, my grandfather and Henry Ford are standing, and there's a third party standing on the banks of the Rouge River. And he'd cut all the basswood out of there, all the way to Ann Arbor. And, uh, 
they made uh, matchsticks. He had his contract with Diamond Match Company. And uh, he uh, also a timber scaler. I remember, I can remember that my uh, father and his brothers talking about John Haggerty bought several logs off of my grandfather when he built a place on Canton Center Road here, a big brick mansion. And uh, they were very good friends. My uncles, they uh, one wanted to go in business, so he had, he worked on the railroad and put himself through business college and then became a elder in the church too. He was quite religious. And, uh, then the younger one, he was my grandfather. Back then, they had uh, barn raising, and uh, I had seen some of my grandfather's old tools from the uh, and my uncle, my uncle James, and uh, my father were members of the Sheldon Barn Raisers. Father front and porch of George Smith's home. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, my uh, my father constructed a barn. It, Uncle Jim had torn it down down on the old uh, Chase Road when they put the superhighway in. And James Wiles, who it was the old High Spears farm, and uh, he told my father, "You can have those barns. You can take them out of there." And so Uncle Jim went down, and I we used to go down after school and help tear those old barns down. And we re we reconstructed one using the old pins and all that wooden pins and. Uh, Build it, and uh, then uh, Mr. Wilkie over here on Salt Road was a building mover. My father had some 50 foot timbers that came out of the barn, and Mr. Wilkie bought them from him to uh, move buildings with. And then we uh, lot, we'd burn up several, quite a bit of it, but uh, I know there's a little playhouse over at Dad's house that uh, my brother and I. It was the old milk house down on the High Spears farm. And we just picked it up, loaded it on the back of a, the old big long international truck we had and brought that thing home. It's still sitting there at my sister's playhouse. And it was quite interesting to see the change from the old dirt road down there in Chase, Chase Road that they built in 94. When they built the Ford generator plant in Ypsilanti, they took all the old tree stumps and all the old fences from those farms and everything and dumped them down in, on the banks of the old uh, uh, Huron River. And uh, then just built the dam, the Edison Company built the dam and they just flooded that all over. That's why the, the drawing rate was so high in uh, Belleville Lake and all through there because they'd go down, they'd dive in the water, and they'd get entangled in those tree stumps and fence, wire fencing and everything, and suffocate. They couldn't, uh, that's how they drowned. And, uh, but uh, my father forbid, well, my younger brother and I to go in there. Well, he forbid all of us, but the two older boys got away with it. <laughs> and our cousins over on Belleville Road, uh, they were excellent swimmers. And they'd go down in there and swim, and they retrieved uh, several drowning, drowning people. My father just built his new garage on Michigan Avenue in 1939, and uh, I was only 12 years old. And he told my sisters to take him over and get his driver's license. <laughs> he had to go into Belleville, the old township hall, uh, brick building. You know, Giffy Charlesworth was the uh, constable. He was everything. Fire chief. I think he was police chief, too. But uh, he, I uh, made, took the exam, and then we had to do a road test. And I know, you know being a mechanic, you never fooled a, me a mechanic's car, because nothing works on it. And we had this one mile leg, and I took my driving testing around town, and I come back up pulled up beside the uh, township hall and uh, stopped and Giffy sat there and he looked at me and he says, you done? I said, yeah. He says, what about that down there? 
then hit me a full, full emergency brake. Well, that thing wasn't even hooked up. I didn't grab that thing and it fell back. <laughs> he looked at me and said, okay, you passed. You did what you're supposed to do. I can't help it, don't work. <laughs> they built a new theater in Belleville. The first one they had was, I said that they just blocked up the space between the two buildings and put a roof on it. And that was a theater, because we'd go over there on Saturday nights and we'd stand, lean up against the building, look, peek through the door when everybody would come out or look to see the movie. Then they went down to Five Points and built a big new building, which is now the city hall. But uh, Darrell Raymond, uh, he has an insurance agency in town there. He was taking tickets. And he'd say, tell us now, he said, now don't all of you come in here at once, just a couple of you come in. And he'd let us come in. And then we didn't have sense enough to appreciate that. We didn't have the nerve to go out and buy popcorn and expect to get back in the show. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it was a big night over there. Uh, be a double feature, hop on Cassidy, different Western uh, Roy Rogers, and uh, get double on my end. I had the old Model A. We'd uh, load, usually it'd be well, the Hightower family, the Doris and Helen, and uh, the Morris. Then it'd be my two sisters, and my brother, and myself. We'd, I'd have put six in the back seat, three sit in the seat, and then three sit in their lap. And then I'd put three, there'd be three of us in the front. And then if we had room enough for one to lay in on with the rest of them. And they would go, go to show Saturday night. And uh, always, I had the old muffler, I had a, a, a noisemaker in the tailpipe, so I'd rev the old car up. Coming home, we'd always stop at Ecorse Road and Belver Road at the uh, Chum's restaurant, and get a hamburger and a Pepsi Cola or something, and big night. And uh, old Harry Aggie, he'd always managed to run me out of town. I'd had that thing making all that noise, and he'd Pull up behind and he's driving a Ford V8. He'd rev that motor up. <laughs> I don't think I was going 30 miles an hour through the whole escapade. <laughs> Back in the school days, in the Sheldon school days, I, don't, I remember the first day that I attended uh, Sheldon school in the little school, and Miss Latour was my teacher. Well, I couldn't sit still, I was always active, so I'd go down the, get, get on top of the desk, and their desk just like those nanomite the runners. I just start at the back and go right down. I crawl on my belly, and when I get to the front, she'd reach over and grab me, and she'd warm my britches good for me. <laughs> and uh, another one, I'd uh, always have to wash my hands to go into the back of the restroom and get, push that thing, get my hand full of soap make like a wash and then come out and as I walk down, I take my hand that soap, rub people on their neck. <laughs> well, then we had, uh, I got a scar in my eye for um, Henry Harry. It was thawed in, my, it was, it had a lot of snow that winter and in the spring of the year, well, in usually March, everything had thawed. That's where we got our skating ponds. And, but this snow, it had rained, and it was real crusty, and he, we were out there sliding around on ice at recess time. He picked me up by my ankles and hit my, and laid my eye wide open off in that crusty ice. Uh, and then we'd play, uh, we'd go back to Fisher's Woods, cut limbs, like for hockey sticks. We, you always could find old heels laying around and uh, take use of those or take a tin can and mash it down and make play. We'd have hockey team right in the big pond right in front of school. And we'd have, that was our skating pond until we were, when we get in the big school, then we could go outside of this park over where it was really flooded and oh, that was a big pond and skate. In fact, I, after I was in high school, I uh, it's semester break, and I was over there skating, showing off, and uh, 
I was skating down and there was all these little thorn apple trees was scattered all through the pond and I reached out and grabbed one of them and I did my thing and uh, got a thorn. The hand was full of thorns but one went in the joint of my little finger and I couldn't get it out and blood poisoning set in and Dr. Perry had to cut it off. But I was fortunate there because of they had me at the university going to cut my arm off. But they got Perry using the old method, soaking it with hot extra salt water and it localized in my hand and told my mother, said, well, we got to lose now, just go as far as we can. And then gangrene set in and uh, he, uh, he amputated me. I recovered good. And I remember the last thing he told me, grabbed me by the shoulder and shook me. He said, I want to see you back on that football field now. <laughs> that was his reassurance. And we had, uh, we used to have a meeting Sunday night to church at Perth League. And, uh, we always, they always tried to have a few excursions. I remember one, we went into the uh, roller, uh, roller skating rink in Plymouth. And I couldn't skate for nothing. And I got to going and I started to go into a curve. Well, I didn't have, I, I couldn't turn, so I went, my foot went right through the music box. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't think they were too happy with me. <laughs> well, we used to move over to Plymouth to Wilcox Pond and have, uh, and Mrs. Hood would make uh, hot chocolate for us and we'd roast hot dogs and Wilcox Pond skate. We had a good time there. Then we used to skate on the Roosh River. We'd either put in at uh, Sheldon Road in the Roosh River or Lily Road, and we'd skate into Wayne on the Roosh River. I remember one year, uh, Clarence Stein and his buddies all got in there in the spring of the year. It thawed, and the river was so high, they, they canoed all the way from Wayne and, uh, on the Roosh River. Uh, that would be on the uh, North Branch. See, out here, the Rouge River splits in the North Branch, South Branch. I remember Dad talking about the river there, right there in Canton Center. I, I think that is the South Branch. But he used to spear fish right there on the farm where they were at. And some good ones, good size ones. I, <laughs> we used to catch boatheads take a straight pin, bend it, make a hook in it, go out there, swim in the river, and then go up the river away and try to do some fishing. <laughs> We'd make a day of it every time we went to swimming hole. Used to have to do, make some decisions. My father tells me, I want this, I want you guys to weed this much of the garden or bug the potato plants. Or and he wouldn't get on Michigan Avenue good going toward Wayne to work. And we'd <laughs> cross Michigan Avenue, head for the Roos River. Just do our jump in the old swimming hole, swim a while. We were the envy of the, the community. I remember the gang used to come down from uh, Denton. And uh, we, they knew right behind my aunt's house in her woods. The river went through there. and. Uh, she had widened the river there because when she built her home, she dug all the gravel out of that Rouge River there and to do the cement work on her home. And, uh, oh, we'd go back in there and swim. Well, the gang from Denton got onto it, and we'd made a rack back in there. And they came down, and we were at lunch, and we came back, and the rack was gone, we thought, but they submerged it in Baldwin Battle Loop over there. He, he was the first one to dive in. He hit that lap. We all but had to carry him home. It really tore him up. So then we moved the raft down to the end of Herbie Street, and there was a pretty good size swimming hole, and we hit it back in there. Tell me the difference between the big school and the little school. Oh, the kindergarten to the uh, fourth grade, fourth grade only attended a half session in the kindergarten in the little school 
and then from uh, fourth to eighth grade in uh, big school. And the big school was the Brick Sheldon Brick School. Brick Sheldon School. And the little school was what? Yeah. That was a, a wood wood structure. It was like a prefab building. I remember the windows were real high. They came down, the sill was standard, but the windows went way up to the ceiling. And they had shades. In order, they had uh, two sets of shades on each window. And they were, they, they were centered in the center. And then you pull them down in one half, and then the other half was upside down, so we had to pull that up. And then tie, we had a thing we tied the rope on. They would hook it, but we always tied the rope. Yeah, that was in the loose school. It wouldn't get, you know, in the afternoon. I couldn't wait for school to be, be let out. It would be so hot. And, you know, we, and I, I can remember taking the uh, standard achievement test. That would be in May, or uh, usually the last part of April, because uh, 10th of May we were out of school. And uh, I remember a lot of them. The farmers wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't show up the last few days. They wouldn't be out the farm. And the uh, hot, it would be so hot taking that standard achievement test. Uh, and I, I used to like the spelling bees. I was uh, Ken Rob. And I had spelled it out, and uh, Ken outspelled me. I was a runner, but my sister, she was champion two or three years in a row. And got a big champ from Detroit News and all that stuff. <laughs> but and then Russ Christman, he was an excellent speller. Usually he wouldn't, uh, they had the spelling bees in the spring. Well, he'd be on a farm, working farm. But this one year, I. Mr. Trot managed to keep him in school, <laughs> and he went. We went down to the fairgrounds, and he was he he was a district champion. Excellent speller. But uh, my mother would work with us on spelling, and she said you must learn how to enunciate and pronunciate correctly. She was a she was a stickler on that. And my father was just as tough. Multiplication table. What's the matter? You ought to be able to figure that in your head and all that stuff. Oh, he he worked with us on that math. <laughs> that was his pet. But she said that. Well, I know there were several kids. They when they got to about the sixth grade, they drop them. Very few of them made it to the eighth. Well, you can see by the size of my class, seven. <laughs> and we were lucky. You lived right next door to the Right next door to the school. Yeah, the uh, school property was on Michigan Avenue, facing Michigan. And there was a sidewalk went right from the front door of the school right out to Michigan Avenue to the end of the property. <clears throat> Our house was perpendicular to, uh, at that time, was Jameson Avenue. But the back of our home and uh, the back of the school were sitting perpendicular to one another. And uh, the, that ball on back in the uh, garden, uh, in the field there, that was all uh, baseball. That was all recreation. Because I know the, uh, the gang used to have the ball games on Sundays. <clears throat> They'd, uh, Dad would either have wheat or corn out there. And if they hit that baseball, which most of them did, they went way out in the cornfield, forget it. <laughs> they'd look for a while, and then they always, but you would talk about hard time. They had those old bats and the baseball. We even had to tape the baseball, though. Could afford new ones. <laughs> and then uh, the bats would be all taped up. And, uh, Sheldon had a pretty good ball team. I know uh, my cousin Russell Williams was on it. But they, they had blue caps and uh, red jer uh, sweaters, shirts, and uh, white pants. They had, a, they had their, they, each one bought their own uniforms. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they play uh, football at night out there behind it. That was kind of a focal point there, or a center of all activity. And Mr. Fisher would usually head it up. He was very good with younger folks. Well, he was young himself. I think it's 
Somewhere. He, you mentioned that he built something for the uh, baseball diamond. No, I, Mr. Fisher did. Yeah. The backstop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He had. Well, you know, he had the greenhouse, and he had all kind of pipes laying around there and everything. And he, he uh, went up there, took his crew. I see who worked for him then. I know well, John Gunther didn't work. He worked for Clarence later, but he lived across the street from him. But I think Bill Winters, I know Bob McKinsey said he worked for Clarence. So he, they used to, Clarence would buy coal by the car road, railroad car road for the greenhouse. And they put it in at uh, Denton Siding, and he'd take his dump truck, go unload it off the car into the dump truck, and then bring it down and shovel it into the uh, boiler room. And I know that's what Bob McKinsey said. <laughs> he, that was one of the last days he worked for time. He said he shovel cold or he couldn't hardly stand up. And, uh, yeah, I used to see Clarence going by with that truck with a dump box on the back. All was coal. He he was quite a fellow in the community. Because now I can recall that our, for our Christmas program, he would go by a tree and uh, bring it in, bring in decorations, and we'd set it up in the brick school building, the big school. And we'd decorate it and everything. And then uh, usually the school was the first Christmas program. Then Sunday we'd have, Sunday evening we'd have the Christmas program at the church. He'd take the tree from the school down to the church, and then we'd all redecorate it and everything. And then uh, after that, he would take it home. That was his Christmas tree for his home, but he, he let, used it for the school. I often thought about it. And rehearsing, <laughs> we had a lot of fun then, rehearsing these play. After we come home, come back from school, from home on Thanksgiving week, we, we'd just put our books away and we'd start reading plays and start organizing our Christmas program. Oh, I used to love that. And working, building stage. We had an extension we built for the regular stage that was there. And, uh, and making our props and everything. I'll never forget that one play. I, <laughs> I had played, I had two parts. I had to play part of a woman. It was a ranch out west. <laughs> the, uh, I, I had, when I had, I had changed, I had to put a dress on. And I forgot to take the to my two six shooters out of my holsters, <laughs> and they were on the back of me. And I remember Mrs. McKinstry, I went out there, and when I'd walk, and pistols would protrude through my dress, <laughs> and it looked like I had great big hips. And uh, she started laughing. You could hear her all over the place. And then the, all the fellows in the cab, we forgot our part, we just had living. <laughs> I stood up there, and I, I know I, I forgot what I what I was supposed to call a liniment. I was complaining about my knees, or and I said, hey. and I, I could I didn't say liniment. I said I, uh, I need some arnicky on these joints. <laughs> and the, the whole audience just they the school was packed, and they just went crazy. They in fact the uh, Walker School had asked us to come down and put the play on for their. Uh, but you know, it would never turn out the same second time. So, yeah, I know in the backdrop, Mr. Trout was standing there, and I got to carry it on, so he reached, took his belt off, and shook it at me. <laughs> then I did laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had, we, everybody started ad living, didn't we? We, didn't, we just made a big comedy out of it. And it went over, so that was what was necessary. Christmas time, we went to get a gift from the school. The teachers always gave us a gift. And uh, in the fourth grade, you got two gifts, because you had two teachers. <laughs> and uh, then we'd go down to, and they, Mr. Fry had the grocery store. He would donate. He'd have a bushel basket. He'd come in there, and he'd either have these little boxes of candy, and uh, or he'd have a paper bag with orange in it. and. Uh, 
some peanuts and some hard candies and all that, and each one got a bag. And uh, we, we did pretty good, we were real good, because, you know, uh, there was, most of the people in there we were large families, and then go to uh, Sunday school party, and well, get another gift. Usually, uh, at the, in the little school, I don't know, the women, they usually gave us a pencil box. And then, uh, what did uh, Mr. Beetle give us? Gave us a rough time, I know that. But uh, I forgot. But we always, at school, fourth grade, you get two gifts. But you get that one, and then at home, it would get a couple of times, it got pretty lean at home. Usually it was real big, but uh, it was a bad year that year, and I know our furnace, see that was a new house, so back then I was only seven or eight years old by the time I got up in the fire pot cracked in the furnace, and Dad had to get a new one cast and have it put in. Well, he managed to get it and have it, so we had heat. We had a wood stove we set up in the kitchen, and uh, got the old fire furnace going by Thanksgiving. And yeah, but uh, the gift, yeah, we always had a gift, but that meal, well, you've seen that picture thing, that table, that's the way it was always on holiday. Always, never missed a meal in that house. There, my mother would have three meals, hot meal, every day. My brothers and I, we used to sit around talking. How in the world did they do that? I can't afford to feed my family like we said. But we raised our own hogs, we had our own chickens, uh, we had milk, and uh, <clears throat> didn't really need much money. I came by, I came coming from the hospital the other day, and I noticed the old Parker Mill. I remember my grandparents taking a grist, going, they lived on Getty Road, they'd take it right up to. Parker's Mill there. It's just a uh, monument now. It, they don't use the old grist mill anymore. But, uh, so, uh, and then uh, on Saturday, <coughs> rain or anything like that, we'd go down either to Christmas or Hopkins or Wilds on Lily Road there and, and go up in the barn and swing by the hay rope from one side of the loft to the other, and we'd play in that, stay in that barn all day. Never worried about eating. Just when you spend a day at the swimming hole, we just come out of there and go, go up and visit somebody's garden along the way. And, well, we managed to take some bread with us or something, and make us take full radishes and take lettuce and onions, make sandwiches. Go on drink, just go upstream away, drink right out of the old river. Heaven forbid they ever do that now. I remember one time and we were in the swimming hole again to Herbie and uh, old man Herbie, he a mean old man. But we did we always we all but all we'd wear a pair of dib overalls. We'd drop them right in a pile and jump in the river. Like he went up and scooped all our clothes up. Thank God for those gardens. Look and see where the tallest corn, well, go pull corn stalks up, wrap around us. <laughs> we had to walk home, we had to cross Michigan Avenue, which you'd stand out there for two or three hours at a time and be lucky. About the only thing to go by would be the Blue Goose bus or the Greyhound bus. And they had both of those running. And uh, But got home. He didn't get much of a bargain in clothes because, you know, uh, raggedy. We didn't have to have require a whole lot of clothing. No, one never wore shoes. What shoes you had left when you uh, left school? That, that was a tradition. Everybody take their shoes off and throw them in a pile in the schoolyard and walk home barefooted. That was a that was a luxury. <laughs> of course, there was no reason to be dra uh, dragging those old worn out shoes with you. Uh, then we get a new pair of tennis shoes. Fourth of July, go go to Ypsilanti. They have a parade up there, a big parade and a carnival, and then uh, usually there'd be a barbecue. 
I know we have cousins over on Belleville Road there. They had, they did have a big, big picnic. Aunt Rosie, she could, she could cook. And that potato salad, but everybody would bring a dish to pass, but she, she always furnished enough food. You didn't need to bother bringing anything, but, and baked beans, oh boy. And I had some good old times then. I used to, I can remember, I can remember going one time over to Aunt Rosie's at the square dance on Saturday night. They'd go in and pull the rug and roll the rug back in the dining room and they'd dance and, and uh, different ones would do the calling. And I remember my mother taking my younger brother and I up and putting us in bed uh, upstairs, uh, hearing the music and everything, but we go right to sleep. Yeah. It was, uh, that was the way they had it. I remember my father and my mother had a birthday party for my father. And uh, he didn't allow no liquor in the house. He didn't allow no. But his own brother, Uncle Jim, he hid, went down the basement where they had the uh, clothes chute, uh, the hamper at the bottom of the clothes chute, and they hid their bottle in there. Because <laughs> the next day, my brother and I, we used to get up. They had uh, one uh, doors it was right across from the bathroom to the clothes chute. We'd pull that back and one would hold it and the other get in it and we'd slide down to the hamper and they asked when we found the whiskey bottle. <laughs> Sheldon had its own dance hall too, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Sheldon Community Hall. That was uh, it was private owned, but they named it Sheldon Community Hall. Yeah, I know when my father built his garage on Michigan Avenue He'd be working on somebody's car, and he'd look out the back door, and he'd say, that's the old Sheldon Hall. Yep. That's where I met my wife. <laughs> that was old. That was Christmas Sheldon Hall, 39. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, and there were quite a few marriages. You know, that sort of thing. But they, my grandmother used to sit on her front porch. We'd ask mother. Can we go and sit with Grandma tonight? And she said, yeah, but I want you to always look, keep your eye over here at the house, because it'd be dark. But the lights in the dance hall would light up, certainly light up the whole uh, street. And uh, we'd sit out there, and they'd open the doors on the side of the hall, and uh, my grandma just sat there, oh, that's old Lawn Delaball there, and look up so-and-so. She knew them all. <laughs> She'd sit there with that shawl draped across her shoulders, and, we did that, and then she'd, uh, she'd uh, uh, t tell us to go in there and look down in the cupboard and get some apples and bring them out and we'll eat them. <laughs> that was one thing I liked about in the winter at home. We yeah. had the big furnace in the basement, and we always had a food cellar full of, well, my mother cheap can everything that was grown in the garden, and we'd have apples and pears and uh, all kind of fruit, and then on top, we'd go in the fall of the year, go out to the woods and get the pick hickory nuts. And then all you had to do was walk down Sheldon Road or even uh, uh, right in front of the old Sheldon grocery store. There was a great big walnut tree there. And uh, get those walnuts and husk them. You could tell you worked the walnuts, a stain get on your hands. But we'd put them on top of the furnace, plenum to dry out, and we pick corn. We grew popcorn quite a bit, but we always parched field corn. And uh, we'd have that up on there, getting it, let it dry out good, and then we'd go down there, that old snow, we'd look out the window of the basement, that old snow would be blowing the wind, whistling, and we'd open up the big door in the furnace. Dad would make us take our shoes off, and he'd try to half sew them, or take them and re nail them, re stitch them. And, and uh, we'd parch corn, pop corn, eat apples, and cider. He'd always buy a barrel of cider and put that in the food cellar. Get that around Halloween time. And then uh, it was, by the time New Year's came, it was pretty ripe. And, uh, but always with Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas dinner, New Year's, you know, we always had cider. That was a part of the meal. And uh, we'd sit down there and that was a kind of a fellowship. You mentioned that Sheldon had a boxing team. 
Mm -hmm. I was, uh, well, Dad, Dad was, <clears throat> I don't know who else from Sheldon Box, but I remember Henry Horton and uh, Grover Place. Dad said, oh, Grover Place was bowling and he could be, but he said he had the punch of a mule <laughs> kicking. And Henry Horton, he was, he was, what, Henry Horton wasn't too, too big, but he was, he could punch. There was, uh, what was his name, from Wayne. And then there was that one out there, uh, uh, he was a Mason contractor later in life, McPhee. He was quite a boxer. Cole McPhee. And uh, the Russell boys later, Excuse me, they weren't boxers, though, they were sluggers. They'd go to dance on Saturday night at Sheldon Hall, and there'd be a fight sure and shoot. And uh, there'd go up on Cherry Hill Road and Cherry Hill there to uh, Jake West. They had to dance up on upstairs at that place on Saturday night. I know Bernie Russell was telling me one day that he went up there and he, that big long stairway, and when he got to the top, top he said he felt like somebody hit him in the head with a ham. <laughs> he said when he wound up down on the main floor, <laughs> he said, no, I ain't going up there no more. <laughs> he headed out. That was all he needed. But uh, they used to have a lot of, a lot of dances there. And uh, I know when I was in high school, we used to go down Ridge Road from Michigan. And we, there was a curve there. Oh, what the heck? about a quarter of a mile down, or a great big curve. We'd see who could take that curve the fastest. <laughs> well, I knew just what my old car would take, so I didn't push it to it, but I had got that car to school. I went out there tearing that out. I remember Bob Ensign, who was going so fast, he had this 36 horse and he couldn't stop. <laughs> so he got on to Michigan, he'd come up to Michigan Avenue, and he just throwed her into a turn, the thing rolled over, and it started spinning, and it welded the front door right to the rest of the body. <laughs> he had to crawl out the other door. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then uh, hazing in high school. <clears throat> there was a lot. The Spencer School District and the Sheldon School District had quite a few students going to Roosevelt. And uh, it got pretty rough with the hazing. I know uh, the sophomore reception. They would, uh, upperclassmen would challenge you to a tug of war over at the normal college. They had a great big pond, and uh, they stretch that rope across that pond. Of course, upperclassmen always gosh, and they'd drag you right through, and it would be cool, oh, Lordy. <laughs> they got, uh, they had finally had to stop it, because they, they took, uh, I think it was two, they always picked on, uh, on the, uh, more timid ones, and they took them out, out on, uh, I think it was out on uh, Grove Grove, somewhere, and took, stripped the clothes off them and left them in their underwear, and one kid got, one of them got real sick, real sick. Then they had this one kid that had a steel, uh, silver plate in his head, didn't know where to know it, and uh, it was, I don't know what they were using on him, but uh, the nerve was grounded on that fleet too. Oh, you talk all oh, that. That's when that's when they put the brakes on it. No more of that. Outlaw. But we used to watch the uh, freshman at the uh, or sophomore reception that the uh, college had, and all of, when you were a freshman in college, freshman sophomore. You always had to uh, wear that little green pot that had an uh, N on it, white N on the front. And uh, when the upperclassmen would come up to you, they'd say, pop crash, and you had to tip that pot and just bow to them. <laughs> they took advantage of you, too. You'd be walking in the, in the classroom or in the building, and they wanted to go through the door, you had to hold the door open for them. And they always... 
And then in the high school division, we had a uh, senior stairway right next to the, the entry was right next to the principal's office. Well, you could go up the third floor and uh, through the stairway, especially if you were late, you, seniors, were, that was their privilege. And, but many a time I'd be late, I'd use that senior stairway. I knew it was going to get caught, and you had to scrub that stairway with a toothbrush. <laughs> Well, I, I, I was never late for class. The yeah. old high school is so much different from the country school. And then bell ring, you had to hightail it to your locker. To, it was almost impossible for you to carry enough books for two classes. So you have to go back to your locker, put the one book, set of books away and get some more out and then go to your next class. And that combination locks. I could never work that thing. I bet it was Christmas time before I knew how to work my lock. Yeah, it was. A, I forget how. I think it was five minutes you had to go from one class to another. Yeah. It wasn't bad when the, or on the uh, main floor or the same floor as your locker, but you had to go over down another floor, though, like in my case. I took a lot of industrial classes, and that was over at the college. So I'd have to hightail it over there and get that class. Workshop, wood shop, metal spinning, lathe, machine shop. We had foundry. I took all of those, and I, uh, I took my uh, pre, I took a pre-flight course, and I, I the reason I took that, I wanted to go in and uh, get get myself ready to go in service. And I took the uh, Navy V-5 at the Naval Air Corps test. I, I passed that at the college, and then I had to go down to Detroit. And uh, they never said whether you passed it or you didn't pass it, but you weren't to go on any further. <laughs> well, there was, out of 12 of us, I think there was three it went on to Pensacola, Florida. And they were washed out there, but they, if you got to go to Pensacola, you were in. But they washed out, and they were in the regular Navy. <laughs> so they just introduced themselves to service in a, earlier. I was lucky. I, 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 I was able to graduate, and I think a week later I got my uh, notes to appear for induction. Who did you meet during uh, the, your time in occupied Japan? Well, that was Fred Barker and Ken Robb. They were, and Henry Harry. I was Hiroshima. And all the shield just knew. You couldn't, everything was just gone. There was nothing. You couldn't visualize what had been there. And, oh, and then get up around, uh, they had this one place where they, all the people who survived the atomic bomb, they were burned badly, deformed, and all, I don't know what all. Um, and then one thing we had to live with there was the fact that you could, there were so many that had been sent to these little islands and, or back up in the mountains, they didn't know the world was over. They just had to be hungry and they'd come out of those hills. And, be a tomato in the gutter, they'd pick that up and eat it. They'd pick up anything they could to try to eat. And then when, while I was there, I noticed uh, the Japanese were very orderly in anything they did now. When we'd come out of the chow line, they had garbage cans, and these people would line up, and they had their little trays, and I had whatever. I, I got to where I just, give them about two-thirds of what I had for me. And I'd just give it to them. I'd dump some in the train and tell them to move on, and I'd get, and I'd try to share it as far as I could. But uh, they, there was no point in using the garbage cans. They eat, they, you know, uh, anything to eat, it was all survive. And uh, kids didn't know what milk was. Well, let's return for a, a moment to uh, Canton. Uh, you were one of the first volunteer firemen in Canton. Yes, it was 12 of us that started. Uh, Bob Waldecker uh, had a board meeting and they purchased a fire truck. 
or they, they hadn't gotten it yet, but they had first it. And Andy Smith Sr., he was the clerk, and uh, the next day after the meeting, he stopped in the garage and he said, uh, George, I took it upon my own to put your name in. And he, and he said, I'm supposed to come up with three volunteer firemen. We just were, were uh, we bought a fire truck and we've got to have some men to run it. So I, I said, I told him I'd have three. And I, he said, I want you and uh, Bill Johnson and George Olympus from the, to represent this section. So, okay, so the following Saturday when Bob Walker called a meeting, they just built this new fire hall, the, the new township offices there where the fire hall is in Sherry Hill, Canton Center. And uh, we had a meeting there to sign up and uh, talk and, and uh, get ready so that when the fire truck came, I, so Bob McAllister was fire, uh, fire chief in Plymouth and he came over and was tutoring us on uh, fire, how to fight fire and everything. And then when the truck came, we had to take it over to put the, what they call the underwriters test on it over at Wilcox Pond there in Plymouth. That was an all day affair and I think it was the coldest day we had that winter. It was cold and that little restaurant up the hill from the pond there, we, we just had a steady line going to get hot coffee. <laughs> but it was quite interesting to see what you, and then we had to learn how to prime the pump. And, that. and then we had to, uh, we took the truck one Sunday and <clears throat> made, made up uh, tags to put on telephones, fire, or, or phone number of the fire department. And you know, it was, uh, they had Mr. Uh, Bill Squires and his wife, Jessie, they had an apartment in there. So the Squires, he was just, his job was to drive the truck to the fire. We were supposed to respond, and Jessie would answer the phone. She would call out the volunteers. Well, nine times out of ten, and back then it was all rural. Uh, just look up where you seen smoke head that way, <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it worked pretty good that way. We had a fire going down. It was at the. Uh, Sawyer Park, Haggerty Road in Michigan down in there. Well, at that time they had a cutoff right there at, in front of John Floden's house. It was a hatchery too. Uh, and we were, Bill Johnson and I were on the back end of that truck. And that man, when he never slowed up to leave Michigan Avenue and go up that, he just turned that and that old truck was on two wheels like <laughs> Both of us just, we just ditched that truck right there. <laughs> and then we took off a running. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was quite a, quite a thing there. But uh, then Lawrence Longwish, who came on as a volunteer later, he moved in and, uh, as a custodian truck driver and a firefighter. But that kid would be out on the tractor in the field, and that siren go off, he'd shut that tractor down. A lot of times he wouldn't shut it off, just put it in neutral and run. They had their truck. He always drove the truck to the field where they were going to work. He'd jump in that truck and take off. <laughs> he wasn't even on the fire department at that time. But since we put him on the guy, he, he was uh, so sincere. A good, good firefighter. Then uh, the chief that retired, he was. Uh, he was a cigarette salesman, and I trained, well, I say I, the, the whole, we trained him. And uh, uh, the fire chief now, his father came on as a volunteer, and uh, that man only had one hand, but he could take that old stub and he'd wrestle that fire hole. He could fight some fire. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, then there was, uh, I don't think either one of the Cordys. It was Fred Cordy, uh, Hump Tyson, and Russ McGraw. And then Joe Silcock was our first chief. And Joe, uh, Joe and Sandy. And uh, Silcock was in there. And uh, they didn't show up to the meeting. And so Dean McClue was assistant chief. So we just moved him up and then appointed another. Fred Cordy was appointed assistant chief. 
And uh, yeah, John Fogel came on as a volunteer. And I was reading an article in some of the papers I had. Uh, and my wife had cut it out of the paper. John and I cooked chicken for the fire department's picnic. We just had to put this uh, cookers. We I made them out of took a 50 gallon bear, drum, cut it in half, and put legs on it. And John uh, and uh, he got the material, and we made the racks. So, Sandwich rack, you know, put the chickens on there and then close it up. And two of you take them, just turn it and, and, and it, you, 20 minutes in time, you put that chicken on that fire, it's cooked. <laughs> yeah, we cooked, and then we uh, I helped cook chicken at the uh, 4 H fair. And uh, then and I quit, I think the second time they had it at the festival here. It's too hot. Lord, it, it's hot to cook it, too. Yeah, they, uh, I remember when you bought the, when Lou Stein came in as a supervisor, we got a new tanker truck. <laughs> and uh, they, how they'd work that, they'd call, but the first one that, I went to the fire hall, jumped in the truck, and took it to the fire. And I would, we had one, I think this was in that trailer park, but 500 gallons of water in the back of that truck. And I'm going down Canton Center Road, Pell Mall, and when I got to Michigan Avenue, it dawned on me, I had to make a turn there, and all that water in that tank. Well, I, I went around the corner all right. I had her, I had the wheels squealing, and I put it into the turn, and it, it tipped. <laughs> But I had it slowed down enough so that the motion wasn't that way. And then when I went into the turn, I, went, I slowed down. They thought I'd gone to a funeral after that, <laughs> driving that truck. <laughs> but we, had a, we had a Proctor barn burn over here. And he said, let it clean up. So we just took it. It was a nice fall day, a night. and. Uh, we spread our coats out on the grass and sat there and put the helmet over your eye and laid down there and just watched her burn. But see, then you, uh, we actually, we could have been handled if he'd had any insurance on that property. So, uh, and then uh, they want to start volunteering old trashy buildings for us to practice fire. And, uh, but the first thing we'd have to ask them, you know, is there insurance? If you've got insurance on you can't touch it. So they'd have to. They had to be insured to have it, uh, have you fight it? No, or? they had to take the insurance off. Had to take the insurance mm -hmm. off? Because we could be, we were responsible. Bob Waldecker was standing next to me, sitting next to me, and we organized uh, uh, good fellows. We had a piece of paper, we all of us signed up. I was trying to think of all the guys that was there. I know Ed Hope was there, and uh, other than the firemen, and then uh, Roy Hawkins over here was there. They, we had a big force turnout. Well, I know Bob signed his name first, or no. There was two or three signed the name, and he said, give me that thing. <laughs> he signed it in here, George. <laughs> you were active in starting the Lions also, weren't you? I was trying to remember that, yeah. I think that, no, I was, this is my past, I was past president. I've gone up through the chairs in the Lions. 20, let's see, six, from 68, I was a charter member. In fact, I was a uh, charter night. We had our charter night party. Huh?